the relationship between the person who owns the asset and those who might want to buy the asset. Mm. Population growth is predominantly babies. Mm. Babies don't buy assets. <laughs> <laughs> going one, going twice, no. You're listening to the property box. All right, guys, welcome back to The Property Pod, your weekly engagement into real estate here in the Hobart Marketplace. I'm your host, Aaron Horn, and welcome to episode 101. It's amazing that we've made triple digits and we're going strong. I'm joined at the desk by the superstars, Johnny Mac and Paddy B. 101 does sound good, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It's like, like, um, no, we didn't stop. Well, it's also like, you know, when you hear like the American... um, the college things, it's like, um, oh, I'm doing Property 101. It's yeah, like, that's right. <laughs> Today, baby, is hey, Property that, 101. That's um, that's actually a pretty good uh, segue for the guests we've got coming on too. Well, yeah, actually, it's not too bad. Yeah, if, <laughs> yeah, if right, you like ever it, had yeah, to have, yeah. a, have a real estate lecturer that you wanted to go along to the lectures yep. and actually listen in like and kind of go from like layman to expert. Yeah, this is the – Today's yeah. guest. Yeah, that's not far off. Mm. Bugger it. We'll go straight into it because, um, yeah, he's waiting on the line and we've got a superstar. <laughs> Pat, you're not getting anything yeah. on the intro today. <laughs> Bad luck. You can talk on the outro. Um, let's cut away and we'll have Simon Presley from Propertyology uh, on the Property Pod. All right. Property 101. That's right, guys. We are joined by longtime guest of the podcast, friend of the show, Simon Presley of Propertyology. Welcome back to the Property Pod for episode 101, Simon Presley. Hello, gentlemen. Nice to chat again. Absolutely. Great to see your face. Likewise, likewise. Beautiful Tasmania. You've been spoiled. Most of Australia's been locked up and you guys have been roaming around like an outing at the zoo. Fantastic. Uh, we had a little <laughs> three-day lockdown the other day where everyone started to lose their marbles and it was um, yeah, interesting to see. We kind well, of, we've, we've lived very luckily down here. The three-day lockdown made me laugh because I on the Monday, which was the last day of the lockdown, I had the office phones because we weren't allowed to open. And the amount of people that were ringing up and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, we're in a lockdown. And most of them were people from Melbourne. And they're like, you're not in a lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I felt like an idiot every time I answered the phone. I'm like, sorry, I can't answer that question because we're in a lockdown at the moment. And yeah. <laughs> I just felt like a fool. So, yeah, we have been spoiled. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. No, very good. no, but things things are going well down here, and it feels like the market's going very well at the moment. Uh, contrary to um, a report that we posted on our 414 Facebook recently, which may have been saying something different, might have been a bit clickbaity in uh, in title, <laughs> and uh, we may have had some some people from Brisbane just nibbling on our little uh, on our lure. Uh, anything you'd like to say to that? Uh, oh. Look, I'll say this to him black and blue on the face. This isn't the first time I've said it. Um, There's very few things on this planet, perhaps with the exception of finding a cure for cancer, than analysing property markets. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of different forces all at play within any one market at any one time. And, And a true skilled professional's role is to try to, you know, know what all those moving parts are, where to find them, and then try to anticipate um, what that's going to produce in terms of a, of an outcome. But I mean, probably Hobart more than anywhere else in Australia, the track record of these so-called experts with their forecasting um, <laughs> in the 230 year history of your great city is deplorable. I was just looking at some numbers, official numbers for, for our own clients. Hobart's median house price gentlemen over the last seven years, and we picked seven years because that's when propertyology started buying there. Mm. Um, the median house price has increased by 120%. Wow. Which has at least double six of the other seven capital cities over that same period of time. Now, I went back and looked at what all these experts, big inverted commas, had forecast each and every year for those seven years. Some years they said it was going to go backwards. Other years they said 1% or 2% growth. If we added all those seven years, individual years of forecasting together, Hobart's median house price might have increased by about 20% over that seven years, and it went up by 120%. So fair to say that whatever an expert says about property markets next year, I learned my lesson a long time ago. Don't take it with a grain of salt or for my own opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Look, and we love that about you, and that's why we keep getting you back on the show because you do have a positive outlook on, on things. And, yeah, it does seem that um, some of the big experts out there at the moment are predicting that Hobart's done and dusted, but you seem to think different. Yeah, I do. Uh, we, you know, there's a couple of parts of Australia that I, we, we still hold some reservations about, namely uh, Melbourne and Sydney. But um, large parts of Australia, something major would need to happen that none of us can be aware of today because there's 
because it hasn't happened. Or they, yep. there's a major decision pending that we've got no way of knowing, you know, could occur. Something like that would have to happen for there not to be property market growth in the 2022 calendar year, well into the double digit years. And I will not be the slightest bit surprised if 2022 is a stronger year than 2021. Now, the REI Tasmania just published this week that Hobart's median house price for the 12 months to September increased by 30%. Yet mm -hmm. again, the best performed capital city in Australia. Don't mm -hmm. be surprised if it does something near that again next year. Mm. Wow, that's a massive difference to some of the others. I think they're predicting only three to four percent. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. Um, it seems to be that the so-called experts, hopefully, they've got a little bit wrong in this case, and we do see this bumper next year. And look, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm always be right, but I, I know our track record's far superior than anybody else's. But, the, but the reason I think we're all, we're all humans, and the human nature, especially with real estate, is there's an announcement uh, or an expectation of something. Um, and if that something is positive, the rhetoric then becomes, oh, there's going to be a property boom. And if that something is negative, the rhetoric becomes it's going to be a downturn. So if you think about when COVID started and the international border closed, um, that something was negative. That something was, well, population growth can't happen with the international border closing. So therefore, property prices can't go up. And all these experts said we're going to have a median house price decline of up to 30% decline. Mm. The opposite happened in a positive respect. The reason for it, as I said earlier, Patrick, um, property markets, it's the sum of a big bunch of stuff. And we need to always remember that what, what's the collective sum of all this big bunch of stuff likely to mean as opposed to one thing? Well, and that was, um, I mean, like, like a sort of, you know, all statistics, et cetera, aside. Um, I mean, one of the things you'd mentioned to us, which is the idea, um, you know, talking about buy mode, buy capacity, and competition at the coalface. Could you could you expand on that? Because it seems to me that that's a real interesting conversation that, um, you know, I had a question in my head. So how is it that so many um, other people just didn't have sort of a same perspective that you had many, many years ago? And it, it had never changed. Like, obviously, they never had as um, positive outlook or won't even use those words anymore. Um, so what is it um, about that sort of framework, Simon, that's relevant to Hobart? Yeah, I guess first and foremost, it's important with these sort of, you know, when we're thinking about what the future might hold for real estate, is always remember that we're talking about an essential commodity shelter. Mm -hmm. We all have to live somewhere. So, you know, property will always perform very, very differently to say, you know, shares on the, on the, on the stock market um, because you don't actually live in a company and they, and they can go wild swings up and down, but property doesn't behave like that. So if we think about the components affecting mood, we don't have to buy a property. Uh, we have to live somewhere, but we don't actually have to buy that property. We're, you know, sure. Presumably, 99.9% .9 of people are already living somewhere. So it's a conscious decision to say, I want to move somewhere else. Now, someone who's going, why mood is important, somebody wants to upgrade their property. They don't have to upgrade their property. But if their mood is positive, it doesn't mean they will upgrade it. It means they might, hit, might entertain it. Um, the I guess the general commentary um, about broader Australia influences that, but also the general commentary about the mood in Hobart influences that. And correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but the sentiment in Hobart has been really positive for most, of the, most if not all, that last seven years and still is today. And I can't understand why it wouldn't be that way again next year. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone out there talking the market down in Hobart. So, uh, you know, when you have, like you said, people talking it up, it just spills through to... To action happening out there in the marketplace. I guess the other thing too is that there is such there's so many people that are stuck at the moment. So we've still got a huge amount that I would see with our clients that really want to move, but can't because yeah. um, everyone's just waiting for an opportunity and doesn't want to be stuck in limbo. Yeah, and that's that's what we refer to as pent up demand. Um, yeah. John, there, you know, there are people who want to do something, but they're currently being restricted from doing it. And as soon as that restriction's removed, a lockdown or the ability to go into state or something like that, then that, then they can fulfil that demand. But the biggest thing that has an influence on on mood in regards to real estate is local economic conditions. The number one reason Hobart's property market has outperformed everywhere in Australia the last seven years is because at the start of the seven year period, Tassie had just come out of recession. Mm. But but from that every single year there's been sustained and exciting improvement in the local economy. Now, as a professional forecaster, I'm looking at all the things that are going to influence Hobart's economy next year. And I think the economy next year is going to be better than what it was this year. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. For example, um, the economic plan that's been released, the stimulus that's in the system, some of those policies were announced in 2021, but they won't actually be implemented until next year. Um, overseas migration hasn't been possible this year. It's probably going to be possible next year. Yeah. Internal migration has barely been possible this year, will be possible next year. All your tourism businesses will be a lot busier in 2022 than 2021. So big bunch of stuff there that the mood that was already good this year I think we'll get even better next year. Um, And the last piece of mood is how we feel about our asset. If we are looking to upgrade or something like that, or we're looking to invest, but to invest, we've got to tap into equity. We're feeling good about ourselves because our property is worth a lot more now than what it was worth 12 months ago and two years ago. So um, mood being one part of the things that, you know, influence our our forecasting for next year, I think it's going to be better in 2022 than 2021. Mate, speaking of mood, you should be the uh, spokesperson for maybe just Tourism Tasmania or <laughs> um, some version of just, you're just like the hype man for Tassie down here, just making me feel good about my home. It's, it's easy to mate. do, John, when it um, comes from the heart and that's how you feel. You have a beautiful state. Much appreciated, my friend. I'm <laughs> sure all our listeners down here will will greatly hear uh, the the mood ups that you're giving us all down this way. <laughs> mood ups. <laughs> so, so I suppose if then, you know, if the mood, like if we've got the positive mood, how does yeah. that transition into capacity then? What's- yeah. So one of the things capacity leads to affordability and, um, you know, the recent uh, within the last couple of weeks, the banks that have come out giving their forecast for next year. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons they've been quite somber about how markets might perform next year compared to this year is they, they are quoting affordability. They're saying, you know, buyers are going to run out of money that, you know, there's been this spectacular growth. They can't afford to pay that. Well, at the end of the day, I would support that statement if people paid cash for property. Who's got seven hundred thousand dollars lying around to buy a standard middle ring house in in your city of Hobart? No one, right? But that's actually not how we buy property. Um, we typically come up with a deposit. Let's a first home buyer. That's the biggest challenge is getting their their deposit um, together. But the bulk of people who buy property every single year are those who already own property. So their deposit money is they they might have cash, um, but in a majority of cases, their deposit money is to transact in real estate comes from equity in what they already own. Mm. So in terms of financial capacity, ability to transact next year, well, deposit money is going to be no issue for anyone who already owns a property because the equity is a shitload more in 2022 than what it was last year and the year before that. The other thing is the ability to service the mortgage mm. because they're not paying cash for the property. They, they're, they're, they're buying it with debt. Well, we've had... 1.5% cut off um, the RBA cash rate in the last two and a half years. Now, for someone with a, let's call it a $500,000 mortgage, they have $7,000 more in their household budget this year than what they did two and a half years ago yeah. without even borrowing any more money, without even getting a pay rise because the, the interest expense coming out of their house, household budget is already less. Um, so, yeah, I don't see an issue at all with affordability, with the exception of those who don't already have a foot in the property market. But sadly for them, they are usually only represent about 5% of buyers each and every year um, anyway. Say that again, that the people that aren't in the market looking represent 5%? Is that what? Like so so the, the first home buyer. buyer. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so they, out of all of the buyers that buy in the market at the moment, first mm. home buyers only make up a fairly small percentage anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Every, every single year. So that's always going to be a challenge for a first home buyer because they, they can't tra- they can't transact in property by using equity and existing asset. They mm-hmm. don't have that existing asset. So mm-hmm. as property prices continue to rise, the size of their deposit they need to save continues to accelerate. So that's always a challenge for them. But mm-hmm. every year they only represent a very small portion of buyers. Yeah. yeah so, okay. so just me on the outside trying to wrap my head around this. Like when I purchased, say, 2018, yeah, I okay. needed a... Forty thousand um, dollar deposit, say yeah. to have like ten percent. What would I need now um, in the current market? Like, do, am I having to get to like to ninety thousand dollars or something to deposit alone, so excluding stamp duty and stuff, stuff like that, Aaron? Yeah, you might need about seventy thousand dollars. Yeah. So mm. as a um, an entry point, that's, that's a whole lot harder yeah. for me to come up with. Mm. And that's yeah. where different finance brokers are talking to people about mum and dad bank guarantors and things Correct. like that using equity in mum and dad's place to get someone like you Aaron into the market Yep, and then hopefully can refinance you in 12, 18 months time 
once the market has improved and you've built equity in the property that you bought today. Totally. So, yeah, there are things that people are doing to get younger buyers in. But, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. It's a harder, point. harder game to play. The federal government have, uh, it's about 80 months old now. I, I believe it's the best first time owner grant policy I've ever seen in my 51 years on the planet um, that uh, you can get into a market as a first home buyer with only a 5% deposit and they will cover the cost of the mortgage insurance. So mm-hmm. um, that that's exceptional. But um, there's a limited number of um, borrowers they will, they will make that policy available for, but it's a fantastic policy and it costs the taxpayer nothing for that. Well, it, I mean, this is just, a, I suppose, a, um, what do you call it, anecdotal observation, is it, especially in our um, markets down here, where it had, had you saw that explosive change from when that was uh, introduced to prices up to $400,000. Yeah. And as that continued to move through and they reshifted it up to $500,000, again, areas like Chigwell and Claremont and other northern suburbs one, you just saw the the difference of the demand right up into that point for first home buyers as far as the federal government would push it. Yeah. In terms of pricing and competition. Yeah, definitely. So so that then um, I suppose that it's a good segue to go into that last component you talk about that competition at the coal face. Um, so obviously that's integrating first home buyers, investors, second home movers. Is that just the buyers against buyers in general? But uh, buyers against buyers and also um, how many options buyers have got to choose from. Yeah. And how many listings? So where a lot of well-meaning people and the sadly economists are the worst at it, they, they think property, they use the term, we've all heard it, supply and demand, supply and demand. It's all about supply and demand. Mm-hmm. Well, it is, but people don't know the components of supply and demand. Um, they believe that supply is how many new dwellings are built in a location in a particular year. And they believe that demand is, you know, what rate has the population growth gone by? Now, both those two things on the supply side and demand side are relevant but they actually have a very small contribution to the overall scheme of supply and demand. There's a lot more to supply and demand. Five of us having this conversation now, we're only born once, so we only add to the population once. But if you ever, you know, um, barbecue discussion, go back and count how many different dwellings you've lived in throughout your life. I did this a few months ago. I've lived in 19 different dwellings, either as an owner occupier or as a tenant. Each time I move, I trigger a demand for housing, but I'm only born once. So, (laughs) So competition is all the, it's a relationship and you guys see it as real estate professionals every day. It's a relationship between the person who owns the asset and those who might want to buy the asset. Mm. Population growth is predominantly babies. Mm. Babies don't buy assets. (laughs) (laughs) They live in costs. But lots of buyers, lots of, you know, transactions occur each day, don't they, Um, in real estate because our life circumstances change and either as a tenant or as an owner occupier, we buy property for a, for a variety of reasons. So here and now today, the number of properties listed for sale in your beautiful city of Hobart is 74% less than seven years ago before your boom started, 74%. In other words, there is nothing. nothing and you know that because you've got nothing to sell. Hmm. Yeah, that's why we so, bought Yeah. <laughs> so there's no, there's no option. <laughs> Uh, on the demand side, we've had no population growth. The border's been closed for 18 months. But the mood has been good. The capacity has been good. There have been plenty of people who wanted to upgrade their house. There have been a, not enough people, but some people have wanted to invest because they've got confidence in the market. So they're, they're buying properties. They haven't been reborn, but they're still looking to buy a property. You've got people who've changed their house because they've adopted the work from home model. And they want a different dwelling to, to, to accommodate that. You'll have people who will want to migrate to Tasmania when the border opens, state and, um, and, and national border opens up. You'll, you'll get retirees that want to move there. So all these things trigger a demand. So And we've got all-time record low interest rates. So all these things are creating more demand than what a market would normally have, more buyer activity. And they are competing like seagulls fighting over a chip because normally we've got lots of chips, but at the moment there's only one, right? There's, mm. there's very few properties listed for sale. So um, for property price growth to significantly reduce, for the rate of growth to significantly reduce, the volume of properties listed for sale needs to increase a heck of a lot. Mm. And nothing could happen in any 12 month period of time to get the volume of properties listed for sale today in Hobart to anywhere near 74% higher like it was seven years ago. Yeah. Mm. That, that will take a long time to get back there. Well, it's surprising that if it ever would. I mean, if everyone's mood, and especially locals, have got the positive element of sticking around and, you know, we're all doing okay, where's the real, real incentive to want to move sideways? 
you know, like um, I'm just, it's a question. Let's see, yeah. would, could we ever really receive a return to that amount of properties moving? You know, even now, like um, my, my question to clients at the moment is, okay, before we even talk about price or marketing, the first question on the agenda is what next? Yeah, like, yeah. what do you mean? It's like, before we even talk about selling, we need to know what you're doing next. Yeah, exactly. Because I can promise you there's, there's not the same options that there were when you last bought this house. So we're, um, it's easy for us to list it and get it done and you're home sailed. What next? Yeah, and there's yeah. just so many, just the moment, like you said, with that pent up demand, who, who don't have an answer to that question. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's fascinating to see if it's ever going to get easier. And if that yeah, remains yeah. really hard, if that remains a hard answer, question to answer, well, it seems unlikely yeah. that there's going to be a huge and probably ex- price. And probably explains why your appraisal to list ratio, Johnny, is so low. You're yeah. scaring everyone out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, mate. This, this is what why- next? Oh, shit, I don't know. <laughs> you better stay. This, this, this is why I podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you two might be having a discussion after the podcast. Yeah, exactly. we are, succession well, might, plan. How's that succession plan going? Oh, mate, I might not be around for 102, so we'll say my goodbyes. <laughs> I'm getting a job elsewhere. <laughs> Might go sell some fish and chips. No, it's a fair point because mm-hmm. there are a lot of people out there that are stressed about that next move. And I think a lot of real estate agents haven't discovered yet our job now is not so much just to sell the house. It's to help facilitate multiple deals mm. together to help someone get to where they want to be. Yeah. Because it's not as simple as just signing them up, selling the house and moving on because mm. you've got to help them find that next property and help them get into that next opportunity. Yeah. And I think that's, I suppose, in many ways where our profession is changing is it's we're much more helping people play that game of chess to make the help them know the second third and fourth move because for them to happen you need to know the back end as well but where where that opportunity is going to come from mm. um playing that just that straight up transactional um part i think is really doing our clients a disservice and that's uh, because of this market very the, interesting the key component to the question of how long how much longer has the boom got to run that's you know probably the most common question i get asked these days the the key component to that is re, is directly related to the volume of properties listed for sale especially in incredibly tight markets like hobart mm. um you broke an all-time record low volume of properties listed for sale for your for the 230 year history of your city five years ago and it's just got lower and lower and lower since so mm. um for the for the enormous pressure that's there now for that to ease the listing volume numbers need to significantly increase so have a think about that as real estate professionals the owners of those properties that's where more supply comes from not Mm. what the developers build the new stuff Mm. you sell Mm. properties i'd I'd be fairly confident that 95 percent of the properties you sell in any year is established stock not new stuff. And that's the same with real estate professionals all, all around Australia. So um, mm. you need a lot more people who already own the property over a short period of time to say, we want to sell the property. So what's going to happen to, to influence their mood to do that? Um, well, the economy needs to shit themselves um, for them to not have confidence in their ability to service their mortgage at these ridiculously low interest rates. to sort of say, we can't afford this anymore. So we better downsize. Mm. Um, I can't see that happening it might happen at some stage in the track but it's certainly not on the radar now so i think these this really strong price growth is here for some years unless some unknown event that's going to tip the world upside down that we can't imagine today happens oh geez how do you get any higher than covid i was gonna say i don't know (laughs) yeah we've kind of hit that point where yeah nothing would be too surprising um but yeah there's been a, a kind of a a globally changing um, situation at the moment and things still seem to be, be booming. So yeah, as you say, Pat, Godzilla may be the, uh, <laughs> maybe the only thing that could change things up. But even then I feel like he'll just add to the limit of houses available for sale. Yeah, exactly. Make it even worse for us. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> you guys can spin it whichever way yeah, you I mean, like. He, well, let's face it. He's not exactly going to build the properties, is he? Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They don't fall out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. Very true. Well, well, my friend, I think uh, we might wrap it up there um, just on the on the chat. But yeah, it's always great to have you on. I'm so glad that we uh, clickbaited you into uh, <laughs> into coming and talking to us again. I'll kind of I'll come up with something good again in in the coming months, and we'll now we'll get you back on board. Just before we go, I noticed in the background you had your REIA trophy there, but I can't mm. see your new Queensland one from a couple of weeks ago. Oh, it's probably up in the. It's probably in the kitchen bench or something. Like that, Patrick. Yeah, it looked yeah, like it was good last weekend. Yes, it was. Um, it was a great, um, great thrill for our for our team. Uh, you know, Congratulations working. on the win. Thank mm. you. Um, yeah, they worked very hard. It was good for the industry to to recognise uh, that last weekend. 
Definitely, mate. Well, thank you, like always, for being part of the podcast. Really appreciate you always reaching out and thinking of us. Pleasure. Anytime. Awesome. Thank you. Not a problem, bud. Thanks so much. Great to see you, Simon. Take care, mate. Well, I don't know about you guys, but like always, G Simon's good at what he has to say. Yeah, he's fantastic. Absolutely. He just puts it in a context that makes it really easy to understand. Like, mm. even if you don't know anything about real estate, as Aaron keeps reminding me all the time that he doesn't, <laughs> yeah. years after working here, like, he just has a way of making people understand, you know. Well, even that talk about su- supply and demand, not, it's, a, it's an oh. answer that we all use, right? Oh, I Is needed it, that, like, emoji yeah. explosion head happening yeah, yeah, there when exactly. he went through and that. It's like, but it's not a good enough answer. And he's no. like, this is what you really, this is what it, this is how you explore it. Like, I heard nice. you exhale. You just were like, yeah, yeah. oh. oh. And yeah, I was just I'm like, like oh, the man, I'm in this industry and I feel like a dumbass yeah. right now. <laughs> hey, that's my thought. Like, hey, we can talk about the next 30 days. Um, that's just like the limitation of my expertise is 30 days. Outside of that, you need to chat with blokes like Simon. You know, It's pretty yeah. amazing when you get the pleasure of talking to someone like Simon and we're very lucky for him to be a major guest of the show. So, yeah, yep. yeah awesome. Yeah, I think that marks off um, number five for him. So, yeah, he's mm. been here for... Uh, for a lot of the journey way from way back. Yeah, um, yeah. We really, really appreciate anything that he has to do. If you're out there um, listening along, go to Propio- Propertyology um, and have a look. You can Google it. I'm sure it's propertyology.com. Yeah, au. Yep. Um, but, yeah, again, thank you so much for everybody that's joined us along the journey. Um, and, yeah, if you really want to learn anything about um, investing or um, anything to do with real estate, mm. Simon Germain, join his mailing list um, and, yeah. Absolute superstar. Congrats on his award mm. and his team's award recently. And congrats on us on doing Property 101. Property 101. Yeah, baby. Awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> See ya. You have been listening to The Property Pod, recorded and edited by 414 Media House in conjunction with 414 Property Co. This podcast is general information only and the thoughts and views expressed is the opinion of our panel and listeners should always seek then use their own investigation into any topic we discuss to ensure they fully understand their own situation. It does not constitute and should not be relied on as purchasing, selling, financial or investment advice or recommendations expressed or implied and it should not be used as an invitation to take up any agent or investment services. No investment decision or activity should be undertaken on the basis of this information without first seeking qualified and professional advice.